go. So hello everyone. And today I'm here with uh, Tan Liang and Dylan. Hi, and we'd like to just showcase uh, what we have done over the last two to three weeks. So um, been quite inspired by how people can use like handwritten tools to convert it into a latex equation or an equation. So we tried to do our own version that uh, tries to just convert handwritten digits and uh, some simple addition, subtraction, multiplication symbols into an answer. So here we have the equation solver. So this end product, the web-based interface after the model was created was done by Dylan using a Flask application that just basically runs as backend uh, the model that we have done using TensorFlow. So this is just the demonstration. So maybe we have like 24 minus 12. And then you just let the model wait here for a while, about one second delay and it would solve up here. See, 24 minus 12 equals 12. So we try something else. We try like 100 times maybe 57. So yeah, it is something that, um, oh, see, we have the answer 5,700. So we can try minus or so, or we can even like minus six here. And then we will see like what we get. I and mean, then I think it works pretty well. So all this, um, now we shall do some brief explanation of how we have uh, done this so that um, our future selves and also whoever who is interested to do this can get some idea of how this is done. So I move to the Jupyter Lab environment first. So in this Jupyter Lab, basically we have, okay, this is under the Tan Liang solver, okay, because Tan Liang created most of it. So what we do have is we have this thing in data where we have all the different classes, as you can see here, like zero, one, two, three, four, five. All this, if let's, let's just open one, are uh, the handwritten digits, okay, like zero, you can see this is a zero that have been extracted from a Kaggle competition. So the Kaggle competition is here. Okay, this one I'll put in the link as well. Okay, so this is the famous handwritten math symbols data set. So it contains a lot of symbols like alphabets, A, B, C, D, E, numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, and also some mathematical symbols. Okay, but for our project, we just did a simple one. Of course, this could be expanded. We just did minus plus equals zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and a times. So this is what we use. Okay, so for the first part, okay, what we wanted to do was we needed to, from these digits, we need to generate an image okay, where the computer can actually be trained to like recognize the different digits from. So we needed our own generator. This is called the equation generator. And so this part, I'll invite Tan Liang to just share like uh, how this was done from the data set of numbers. How do we get our equations? All right, Tan Liang. Right. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chongming, for the introduction. So now I'll take you through how we actually generated some equations that we later on used to test our classifier uh, later on. So, so the first step is actually to get some handwritten equations. And we do this because uh, we, we can't simply... Uh, I think that another way is to actually just write your own equations and, and just uh, take a photo and just upload it. But this is another way of doing so, which is to actually uh, get uh, equations from the handwritten data set that Chomi has just uh, introduced. So I'm going to take you through the way that I did this. Um, so it is based on some code uh, in three steps. So uh, in step one, what I wanted to do was to be able to generate uh, random equations on, on my own. So um, I used uh, three operators, um, plus, minus, and times. Um, and then I, I created some code that actually randomly samples uh, numbers between zero to nine. So randomly picks a number, picks an operator, and then picks another number again. And then, uh, it, and so this forms your, the first part of the equation really, right? And then in the next part of the, uh, this code, uh, I get uh, Python to actually evaluate the answer out. So that's it. under answer equals to evaluate generated equation. So the output of this, this code is uh, an equation that looks something like the output of the cell below. So 32 times 61 equals to 
1952, uh, uh, something like that. Yes. So the, the way I create this equation generator, I allow it to um, decide uh, how many numbers to actually uh, generate. So like for example, here, uh, by default, it generates two numbers on the left side of the equation. So you can go up to any, any, numbers, uh, any, any numbers you want. And also, I allow it to um, fix um, what, what's the maximum number that I can go to. Like for example, here, the maximum you can go is 100 for each, each, each number. But you can actually go up to further, depending on your, your requirements. So that's the equation generator. Okay, so then... Actually, can we try it out again? So this was one random generator equation. Let's try running the cell again. And you see you get another equation here, like 93 times 5. And the operator is random, so you can get plus, you can get minus. Basically, we are trying to simulate the entire possibilities of like what we could get right in the in the in the while or like what people could write using these operators. Yeah. That's can right. I can I just also like um just uh, so over here, um do uh look over here like this eval over here. Um we actually did not did not get the neural networks to do the computation because that will increase an, a layer of complexity. So we get what the computer do that it does best, which is compute. So getting all these symbols here and numbers, the computer will actually give the, the right answer here. Okay. Uh, Danley, you have anything else to add? Uh, I think that's all that I have for the first part, which is on how we actually generated random, random equations out. And the next part of this is to actually uh, create uh, handwritten uh, images of the equation that we have randomly generated, which is step true. You are going to pick an image for uh, for each digit in, inside the equation. So we do so from the handwritten data set uh, that, that Chongyi has downloaded. So what this does is first we have a helper function for us that allows us to randomly sample a file from a directory. So as long as you specify what directory it is, for example, you specify that it belongs to the zero directory or the plus directory or the times directory, it's going to randomly select a single image from it. Yep, that's the one. All right, and then um, and then my main function is the generate equation image function. So what it's going to do is it reads the equation that we have generated just now. So just now that was uh, can can I scroll a little bit? Okay, so eighteen plus twenty equals thirty eight, right? So for each digit or each operator, so let's say one, the first character is one. For each character in the equation, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to go to that particular folder uh, one. Uh, folder one, and then randomly pick an image from that folder. Okay, and then and then it, it will read the file, and it's going to read it in a numerical form that the computer will understand. So in pixel form, so it looks like an array of um, digits between zero to two hundred and fifty-five. Yeah, looks something like that. So each each image has this array of numbers that represents that particular image. What this is going to do is you are going to concatenate. Uh, as you finish reading the entire equation, you're going to concatenate all the images together into one giant image. So at a computational level, it's going to concatenate everything into a giant array. So, so maybe I just yeah. draw this out. So like maybe if it's 18, you will take the one and read out the one, and then this will be like put into an array of digits. Then we take eight, put into an array of digits, and then you stack it up horizontally to form like a massive image like this. Massive image is represented computationally as an array of numbers. Yeah, so in the end, all this will become one array. Yes. Like this array here. Yes. And this is so that the computer can read it. Okay, cool. That's okay. great. All right, shall we? Yeah. To the next uh, step. Yeah, and the next step is very simple. So uh, the, the point is that we wanted not just a single image of an equation, we want to be able to generate a lot of this and so and so that we can save it somewhere and so uh, what i did was just to create a for loop i specify all the the parameters that i want like for example i specified that i wanted 50 i wanted to create 50 equations each of these equations should have two numbers so on the left side of the equation and, and these numbers should not exceed 100 and i'm going to save them so save equals to one um so and therefore i create a for loop uh for each image, yeah, generate the equation, and then you generate, you pick the image, you pick the correct okay. image, and yeah. Some, some yeah. people just don't write very well, so you look at this. <laughs> <laughs> look at this. 
Yeah. <laughs> number five is this like, is oh, horrible. No. <laughs> this is just some, some of these images are horrible. This yeah. is not a, a bug in the program, by the way. This is the data set that we have. This is truly the data set. Look at this. So yeah. it tells me that people who actually do math don't write very well. Sorry to the mathematicians, but how do we read this? But but you'll be surprised, you know, a computer can actually read this better than us because yeah. they can recognize more patterns. Yeah. Surprisingly, the when you fit it into a neural network, you can you can recognize these images. Yeah, so, so yeah, this is cool. it. Mm. We have all these equations generated that we also do for three digits. All, all yeah. these are basically our training set. And just to let you all take a look, it will all be in this equation images. The two numbers but not one for it. Yeah. will be here. And then the three numbers one will be like this. So yeah. all this will then be used for the needs of the program that computes what these numbers would be. So maybe let me just do a, a, the first part of this. So this will basically, this our code to actually train the image classifier. So we actually, in order to make the problem easier, okay, unlike um, traditional uh, deep learning approaches to like images where you have like three color channels, like for example, ImageNet. Uh, in this case, we are just processing digits that are handwritten and preferably gonna be on a whiteboard. So we think that um, we can just do a simplification process to make the network work better and just binarize it. So by binarize, we just basically save it as black and white. <laughs> so like the white parts will contain where the strokes are, where, where the digits are, and then the black parts will be the background. So this is the binarize function here. Okay, then basically we take a, we do a data generator using the TensorFlow Keras pre-processing layer. Okay, and this will basically take from the directory. So we already have a directory which is here, this data directory. We feed it this directory and then TensorFlow Keras will automatically do the different classes out for us. This will be the classes. Specify that this has to be the correct, uh, the, the, the particular directory structure. So the directory structure has to be this, this way. Otherwise, ten, train data gen flow from directory just won't work. Right, yeah. so this train data generator uh, will basically sample from all this and then use it to train the neural network. So the neural network will receive an input, okay? That it that looks like, okay. Let me. Okay, there's there's been a lag in this server, so we will just uh wait a while. Yeah. So the neural network will receive a, an image that looks like this, okay. But we will firstly binarize it so that we basically reduce the complexity of how the network looks at the digit by making it just purely black and white, okay. Instead of having like a scale of different colors, okay. So all this is actually done using a pre-processing function here, okay, which basically calls the binarized function that we described earlier, which we just basically uh, converts the image into two different um, possible yeah, colors. Yeah. yeah. So just to describe the neural network that uh, that was used, this is actually a convolutional neural network. So uh, the first up is actually a rescaling layer, which basically just converts it. Because black is like 255, white is zero. We want to convert it to like between zero and one so that the neural network can train better. If you don't normalize your input, the neural network is not going to train as well. Uh, then we go through a convolutional. Okay, so first up, I forgot to describe the images are all 45 pixels by 45 pixels. Okay, so later on when we do in the wow images, we will actually rescale it to 45 by 45 pixels and one channel, which is uh, like black and white grayscale channel. So 45 by 45 is the input size to this. We've passed through a comp uh, layer. So comp layer of 32 filters, three by three each. Okay, max pool, comp layer, max pool, comp layer, max pool. So this is like a very standard, like VGG-like architecture. Flatten it at the end so that we do classification. Uh, pass it through one to eight uh, nodes before passing it through num classes, which is this classes here. So what the network basically does is like this, is taking the image like this. Okay, and then it just passed through a CNN or convolutional neural network. And at the end of this convolutional neural network, what will happen is that it will basically output the, the probabilities of it being in a certain class, like okay, using like a softmax function at the end when we do the um, training. So it's like, is it is it class one, class two, class three, class four? So it will, it will basically tell us like what is the, the probability associated with maybe like 0 0.1, 0 0.7 and so on. Yeah, so we basically know like, okay, so in this case, the input image is a, is a five, right? So I should probably make this a five. 
<laughs> so so it basically will give us the the um like assessment of like how likely it is to be in one of these classes. So it's using a CNN to classify the output. So this is the main like pipeline whereby we take in the input image that is like binarized as pre-processed into a 45 by 45 pixel image. And then we pass it through a CNN. And then after that, it will then output what is the um, class of, um, basically what, what is the, the classification of that, that image, okay? So this is the parameters for the network. Okay, we then train it with like Adam optimizer and the categorical cross entropy, which uses like um, what I said earlier, the softmax function. And then basically it just measures how close it is to the real one, the, the actual category. So we feed it over three time steps, save this uh, as a save weights. So this save weights later. So in the website that you see earlier, we don't actually have anything um, that, that like you don't actually have to train this neural network when you actually code a neural network out is basically going to be something like this. You train it on your extensive data set and then you save your weights. All you need to do is later you just load your weights and you can just run the model, which is very fast, much faster than training it. Like over here, you can see that it took like a few minutes to train the data set. Okay, but if we were to load it directly, you will see that the, um, the inference time on the web page that you saw earlier was almost instant. There was a delay only because it was programmed in. Yeah, if not, it will be right a few milliseconds. All right, so after that, what we do is uh, we have to do some form of detection from the image, like how to actually detect the numbers. So if you recall correctly, early on, what we did was we created sample equations, right? Like, like this, 18 minus 28 equals to minus 10, something like that. So we will actually need to find out like how to actually segment all this so that we fit in. Remember the neural network only takes in a 45 by 45 image. We want to actually give it like this, a 45 by 45 image so that it can actually uh, classify the, the digits correctly. So yeah, I don't want to do this part or I, I do it. <laughs> yeah. I can do it, I can do it. I can take, I can take our viewers through it. So yeah, uh, maybe we'll go down a little bit. So basically what we have here is we are defining some things, uh, we're defining the path to the image directories, we are defining the functions, the helper functions that we are going to use later on. Maybe we'll scroll down a little bit, then we go through the main code itself. We start here? No, no, just go to 41. Yeah. Uh, oh. Oh, I see. Yeah. No, so actually, uh, what you talked about just now is you take the image from the image path. Yes. Okay. Yeah, then, you, you take an image path and then you read the image. And then what you're going to do is the detect contours function is actually the, the main function that we're using here. So uh, this is what Chongming was describing when you actually create the bounding boxes over each and every single one of the images. So what we do is we're not using a machine learning model like a very fancy one like faster RCNN or YOLO here. We are actually using uh, OpenCV2's function, uh, which is uh, a bit... Uh, simple detect contours function. And what it does is for every everything that is connected, right? For example, the entire digit one is connected. It is connected because you can use one line and draw the entire digit at one go. So for everything that is connected, it is going to draw a box around it. So this is the detect contours function. You will actually find one of the tightest fitting right. boxes. Around, it, and it finds one of the tightest one. Uh, around right. That's a right. particular stroke. So it's right. quite convenient for this purpose when your equation is going to be left, right? Correct. That's right. That's right. And after it finds the contours, it, after it finds, so finding contours means it finds the locations of the image where there is a single uh, connected uh, eight layer. Yeah, so then after the, that, it will draw a rectangle around like it. This, where all Correct. these orange Correct. boxes will be drawn around the equation. Yeah. Correct. So so that's the CB2 dot bounding rec that you will see somewhere in the code. Yes, that's the, that part that Chomi has highlighted. So, so that's it. So this is very nice, but okay. So we also did some code to clean up uh, overlapping rectangles. And this happens because sometimes the image is not entirely clean. Like for example, there could be uh, uh, like dots or something, or, or, or like for example, right? The, the most uh, easy example will be the equal sign. So the equal sign is made of two dashes, correct? Right? Yeah, 
And these two dashes are not connected at all. So what the find contours function is going to do is it's going to draw a box around each dash instead of drawing a box around the entire equal sign, which is what we do. Yeah. So the original function actually does what Chongming is doing right now, but we want the box to encompass the entire equal sign instead. And that is I the reason. I thought it would be interpreted yeah. as minus, right? Because like the yeah, equal, correct, like correct. Minus signs yeah, combined. it's like two minus sign. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. So no, that's not what we want at all. <laughs> so what we did was uh, we, we, we came up with some code up on our own to actually clean up all these boxes. And the idea, the logic behind it is that as long as the box overlaps in the X axis. So in this case, the equal sign overlaps entirely in the X axis. We are going to consider it as one box. So over here is actually a bit of knowledge um, engineering here. All right. We actually imbue the knowledge that uh, we are not going to have any overlap top and bottom. So of All course, right. this use case means that we cannot have stuff like fractions because for that, we need to have special logic for that. But what we do is we basically combine the bounding boxes that appear in this same um, X axis. And so this equal sign, if I were to redraw it with another color, um, this will in the end look like this. We just combine, oh no. Okay, let me just redraw that equal. So in the end, the, e the equal sign will um, not be regarded as two separate boxes, but because of the combination using a rule-based system, we actually will have this box here instead. Yes. Yeah. So all this, I believe, is done down here where we merge the intervals. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. so uh, there's also like stuff like get overlap where you merge to a bigger box if there's... Uh, yeah, like for example, the A, right? Actually, what OpenCV will do is it's going to draw one big box around the A, but it's also going to draw one small box on the top part of the A and the bottom part of the A because, you know, that part, they also... Yeah, they, they, yeah. let me just draw this out here for visualization. So, like, let's say you have an A over here. Yeah. Your algorithm might have this as one box. Correct. And then the this bottom part one as one box. And the overall eight as one box. Yes, exactly. That is yeah. what's happening here. So there's just too many boxes <laughs> and we don't want that at all. So, so that's the reason why. So the overlap, can I just say, as to just basically preserve the main box, preserve yeah. the main box so mm. that we let the neural network only work with the main image. That's right. Yeah, actually, uh, just to give some parallels, um, this way of like getting mm. the overlap box is also used in like many much uh, deep learning architectures like YOLO, uh, SSD, mm -hmm. where you use like intersection over union, where you basically pick the rectangle or the bounding box that actually has the greatest intersection, of course, with the highest probability of the classification. So we are doing uh, quite manually, like what this um, is doing, but this manual method is good enough for our use case. Yeah, but of course, if we want to do something more complicated like fractions and stuff, you have to probably use some form of like YOLO kind of bounding box proposals, okay? Because um, there's going to be uh, many, many um, different situations that could happen. Um, maybe using this bounding box proposal method might be a more effective one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's... Uh... Okay, so the contours function that we are using here. And maybe Chongming could show the output of the... Yeah, of the function. Okay, so basically after we do the draw contours, let's just load this, okay? And then when we see all this here, okay, after we do the detect contours, we have a bunch of coordinates, x, y, w, h, x and y co uh, coordinates, the width and the height. Okay, and then we can just plot a rectangle to just let you see how this looks like. So this will be like how it looks like, 9 minus 65 equals minus 56. So yeah, to plot the box. Over here, the minus actually the box is really very squeezed. <laughs> you can't really see it, but there's a box there. So yeah, all this works. We can also like maybe show for a different kind of equation. Like let's say let's just do like 42. Yeah, so you can see there are cases whereby this wouldn't work out that well if it's too like squashed up. So you see this was uh, interpreted as one. So these are different things that like are some limitations of the model, but you can see that like for most cases tends to, it seems to work very like, well, like 12 plus 10 equals 22. All of the boxes are worked out um, pretty well. And OpenCV2, um, this method, fine contours works quite amazing for this case. Of course, as extensions, we can consider using like a YOLO model to train this, <coughs> which would require a bit more um, compute, okay, which is definitely possible for more advanced use cases.
Okay, uh, maybe we just do the last part. So uh, the last part is like predict with model. So actually we coded this whole function ourselves. This is called resize pad, where basically we want to make the, we want to scale up the, okay, so the intuition behind this is like this. If we have like a number two, okay, but remember our canvas was 45 by 45, right? We kind of want to like scale up the two, preserving the aspect ratio and like centralize it within this 45 by 45 image. So this resize pad function um, yeah, does just that. It preserves the aspect ratio, scales up the image so that it fits within this uh, 45 by 45 pixel. Okay. Uh, let's show me you can show the example where uh, we are resizing and adding the minus sign because the minus sign, as you can see, is very flat, right? Just now we showed that the minus sign box is actually very flat. Okay, sure. So uh, there's this resize pad. Oh, or the equal here. Yeah. Okay, I wonder if we actually have the, the thing over here. Okay, because it's not in the code right now. We have to we have to code it out if you want to show this. Yeah, but, fine, uh. yeah, but the, the idea behind resize pad is basically yeah. just to, to make it correct. Right. It, it resizes it to 44 by 44. In the meantime, it's padding it to its uh biggest uh, aspect ratio. Yeah, so that every, everything is centralized. Yeah, so you can see over here the resize pad is here. Mm -hmm. I guess what I can do is I can uh we can just show here, like okay, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just do one time first. So for example, uh, in this nine minus six, so this is the, how we actually get the model. Remember we actually save some weights. Now we load these weights here. Okay. Then um, what we'll do is we basically binarize the image. Okay. And then run our, run, run our function earlier in the, remember the keep that we have earlier, we basically do the same function again. We basically do this um, detect contours in order to find out where these boxes are. Okay, so this will be our keep. And then for each of these boxes in the keep, we have basically, uh, we basically extract our image using resize pad. So let us uh, show you how this looks like earlier. So like nine minus 65 equals minus 56. We actually like um, get this like um, black thing here, like nine minus 65 equals to minus 56. We train, we train our neural network over here. And then um, we actually get all this classification. So over here is actually like um, treating this five as a, as a nine. Okay, so this is like one a negative example here, but overall it's more or less correct. Okay, this five was also quite badly drawn. So just to let you have an idea of how the resize pad looks like, let, let us just um, do a plot.im show this image here. So maybe I do the before and after. Okay, so the before is is this one. So this will be the before image. Okay. And then we will show you what happens after we do the resize pad. Okay. So the before image was like that. And then after a resize pad, you can see that it's padded to 45 by 45, but it's preserving the aspect ratio. Minus already the same. This six, when it's padded, it becomes like this. This five, it becomes like this equals minus this five becomes like that, six. So you can see that um, the input image to the neural network is really just this one. Yeah, so it's really padded into a form that is quite suitable for the neural network to do it. Okay, so yeah, that is more or less how we actually implemented this. Anything else to add, Daniel? Yeah, I'm good. I think that's, that's all that we have for our prediction model. Yeah, so I think the most cool part is how to upload this to the web, okay, which can be the focus of another uh, session, okay, because that itself takes quite a lot of time. And uh, we have to thank a lot to uh, Dylan, the magician, okay, to actually put this out. I really feel like uh, for, for deep learning products, especially like just doing it on JupyterLab, um, it's not uh, entirely sufficient, especially when you want to let it go out to like, some use cases outside. It's, it's very nice to actually code it out into a website. And, and that, that will be something that I think will be very exciting to, to know how to do and to implement it. So yeah, we'll share more about that in another video next time. So let's just see this last one, like 24 plus five. And you can see that what the model will do is, oh, is the server lagging? Who you read? You, uh, there we oh, go, 24 there. plus five equals to 29. So you can see that 
Oh, I forgot to explain one last part. Okay, maybe we go back here. So after we actually predicted the class over here, okay, uh, we will basically join them into an equation list like this. So you can see that at the end of it, what the classes predicted, this, uh, the, this like we get the first image, you get nine, second image, you get minus, next image, you get six, next image, you get nine. Yeah, so in the end, you will actually get this entire equation up. So this is something that we do here, like we get all this and then we get the entire equation out. Over here, we run the eval function and then we get the final answer here. So yeah, this is uh, something that is pretty cool. I think this is, I, I'm very grateful that actually we have done this. This is something that I was thinking of doing for quite some time already. Yeah, and uh, moving on, you can see that this is not perfect. You can see that like the, the cutting is, is not that great. Uh, we could improve on this. We could use uh, some form of bounding box proposals to do this instead of uh, the open CV function. And we could also incorporate more symbols and we'll consider exploring it, going to latex. Yeah, so I maybe mean, we can also do some trials here. Okay, like we can try to give like, like, try to find cases to break our system, okay? So like we can draw a very large, oh, this is the wrong one. This, <laughs> we can draw a very large, okay, ah, there we go. We can draw a very large tool and then maybe draw a very small fork. We see whether it's able to handle objects of various scales. Okay, so maybe 24 plus six, okay, just to make it different. So let's see, yes, because it's a very well-known thing that uh, deep learning doesn't really handle skills that well. So you can see that um, it almost got it right, except this very large tool, okay? It interpreted as a four instead, uh, as a one instead. Why overlapping numbers because of the draw contest yeah. so function? Over here, I, I think the issue is the two because it yeah. interprets wrongly. Let's try, let's try to do one where, whereby it interprets the two correctly. So let's try a two like that and see whether it, okay, this is a two. Now we try a very small number, like four. Okay, I just want to see whether it can handle the various scales well. So, oh, you see, it works well. Okay, so this is actually an advantage compared to like most modern networks. Okay, of course, if you were to do like two to the power four, then this wouldn't work because our network doesn't do it. But you can see that, uh, let's try a mega eight like that. You can see that this is actually quite scale invariant for, for this network. Okay, why they interpret that as a four? <laughs> okay, so this is uh something that let's go back. Maybe let's try that again. Okay, so maybe it got confused by this initial four over here. Okay, but if I draw back the eight at the normal size. Yeah, so this is some stuff that uh, could be improved on. Yeah, I mean, of course, you see, if you use deep learning methods, at least for one is using this, uh, oops, why did I draw that? Using this approach, what we can get is that we already know that the program will actually do it like that, the bounding boxes. And so this means that actually theoretically with any size we input, as long as there's no overlap, it should actually work. So, okay, I think this uh, more or less showcases some of the like vulnerabilities that uh, maybe a deep learning system can have. And of course, more like adversarial examples could be uh, improved. Maybe we could have a discussion, like how, how do you think we could, we could solve this? Like different skills affecting the other. Yeah, actually, I, I think I, I know like roughly what can be done. And that has to do with, uh, like augmenting the, 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 the data set actually. Like you can augment with different skills. Like over here, the four looks like a two. But you see, at least based on the um, method that we use, you see, it can detect the one and the eight quite perfectly. Okay, of course, this four here, maybe in the data set, there's no two like that. So this, this definitely could be improved on. Let's, let me just give another example. Like we use multiple eights, like eights with uh, increasing sizes and see whether this can detect. Okay, let's see. Oh, see? So actually, it's actually the issue of my four. <laughs> I think my four is not, uh, maybe the data set, the four looks like this. Yeah, so this could be one of the reasons why. So if, 
if we look at the, um, the product that we have right now over here, um, it, it is pretty scale invariant. And that is actually inherent based on the way that we did the, um, the, the way to select the images. And that may not be possible in like, most modern architectures. So yeah, there are some good parts and bad parts and definitely some ways to improve. But overall, I, I think this has been quite an experience actually, especially for myself. I think for Tan Liang too. Yeah, this for me is as well. I enjoy coding out the model. Yeah, it's, it's quite mm. cool. It's very it's cool fun to, to see, see the product, right? Yeah, very cool to see deep learning in real life. Uh, yeah. Dylan, you have anything to say about uh, your experience coding the website? I practice copy pasting from Stack Overflow. Yeah, he's just being humble. Yeah, we have a uh, we have a uh, Dylan the magician here who's able to do this kind of thing, and yeah, yeah he's our guru that actually designed <laughs> this entire web, web interface and moved the Boolean code to front end API. So, yeah, this project will be successful without him. Yeah, I anyway, I hope this uh video will be useful for like us down the line when we look back again and we see like how what we've done in the past, and also maybe if you are inspired to do an equation solver like this on your own. Feel free to go ahead. Yeah, we'll probably be sharing some of our earlier quotes with uh with you on the link as well, so you can just work on those. Yeah, and definitely this is not like um the end. There's many things that could be done to improve it, especially the bounding box part. And yeah, we'll see whether we can uh, make it work better. Yeah, if not, uh, yeah, thanks and uh, see you all next time. Okay, bye.